Hello and welcome to topic 20, which is the last topic of the AS modules in OCR A-level chemistry, which is all about analytical techniques. Of all the topics, this is the one that people tend to overthink. On the data sheet, they'll give you a whole list of things for infrared spectrometry, and there's really just two or three that you ever need to use. So I'm going to keep this explanation short in the hope that you won't overthink it. So first thing we'll talk about is infrared spectroscopy. Bonds absorb infrared energy, it makes them vibrate more. And different bonds absorb different frequencies of infrared radiation. Now, get over the fact that this doesn't say frequency and this doesn't say absorbance. It always looks the same and all you need to be able to do is interpret two small parts of it. Don't worry that the axis seems to count down from 4,000 to 500 and that's not what you're used to. Don't worry about the crazy, zigzaggy, wibbly wobbly nature of the graph. There's two things you need to look at. I'm going to tell you what they are. Okay, so this part of the graph goes like this. And it always looks like that. And just don't look at it. No one cares. By the time the wave number reaches 1700, or around 1700, if it does this, or something like that, that means that there's a carbon-oxygen double bond in the molecule that you're looking at. If it doesn't do that, there's no carbon-oxygen double bond. Then look a bit further. If it does this, there's an oxygen-hydrogen bond. If it's got both, that means it's a carboxylic acid. If it's got an oxygen-hydrogen bond, there's no carbon-oxygen double bond, then it's an alcohol. If it's got a carbon-oxygen double bond, but no oxygen bond, it's an aldehyde or a ketone. You answer the questions by referencing the data sheet. So it says something like 16, 40 to 18, 20, or something like that on the data sheet for the wave number of this carbon-oxygen double bond peak. And for the OH, it's got slightly different values for if it's an alcohol or if it's carboxylic acid, so U flow. But basically looking for this big bad boy and then this pointy one. And that's it. And there's just one thing you need to watch out for, really. Sometimes this isn't here, but it turns out that carbon-hydrogen bonds also absorb around this point. Don't get confused between this big broad one and the kind of spiky ones of the carbon-hydrogen. I'll show you what I mean by carbon-hydrogen bonds. Carbon hydrogen bonds look more like this black one. It's not big and broad like this OH peak. And so that isn't an OH. Sometimes, because it's in the same sort of place, you'll get confused between this and this one. So if it's big and broad, it's an OH. If it's not big and broad, there's no OH. Almost all organic compounds have CH bonds. So this is nothing special. The OH and the C double bond O, all you need to look. The uses for infrared spectrometry outside of the organic synthesis lab would be monitoring pollutant gases or atmospheric gases. So for instance, carbon dioxide has carbon oxygen double bonds, and so the size of this peak tells you how much carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere. And you can do the same with methane. Methane is a greenhouse gas, and so the size of these CH peaks give you an indication as to how much methane there is in the atmosphere. And another use using this OH peak is for breathalyzer tests. In a breathalyzer test, you're testing the breath for alcohol, and alcohol contains OH groups, and you can tell how much alcohol someone's got in their breath by using these OH absorbances. Now, if you're really good using infrared, you can also look at carbon-oxygen triple bonds from carbon monoxide and nitrogen monoxide bonds, but we don't need to be able to do that or analyze it. The majority of everything we do is oxygen-hydrogen and carbon-oxygen double bonds, and more often than not, they're linked with some kind of oxidation question. Because, for instance, alcohols have only the OH. If it gets oxidized to a ketone, it'll have this carbon-oxygen double bond only and no OH. If it's oxidized to an aldehyde, same thing, you get a carbon-oxygen double bond, no OH bond. And if it's oxidized to a carboxylic acid, then you get both. And so quite a lot of the time they link this with oxidation of alcohols. So you can work out whether it's a primary alcohol, secondary, or tertiary. Because a tertiary alcohol will be left with just OH because it doesn't get oxidized. Secondary alcohols go to ketones, so you get this peak, but not this one. And primary alcohols get oxidized all the way to carboxylic acids, so we have both of these peaks. And that's it for infrared spectrometry. Next, I'm going to talk about mass spectroscopy. So mass spectrometry measures the mass of things. How it works is you take a sample, it gets ionized, by firing electrons at it, it gets accelerated through an electric field and then deflected through a magnetic field. And then depending on how much it gets deflected, you can work out very accurately how much that ion weighs. And 
At the end, you've got a detector, and that detector just plots a graph of how many things it detected at each mass. And almost the entire time, the only peak that you care about is the peak furthest to the right, because that's the whole molecule and the mass of the whole molecule ion. Okay, so this peak is called the molecular ion peak, and it's due to the molecule having one electron knocked off. And so whatever the number here says, that is the molar mass or the relative molecular mass of your molecule. Now that's almost it for mass spectrometry. You don't need to know how a mass spectrum is made. You don't need to know anything about electric field or magnetic field or deflection or detection or this mass charge ratio that's written as mass charge ratio. You only need to know that as mass because every charge will be one. And I've never seen a question about fragmentation patterns, but fragmentation patterns is on the specification. So I'm just going to talk about it very briefly, just to cover all bases. Now when you fire the electrons at a molecule, to make the molecular ion peak, it just knocks off one electron. But what can happen when you fire those electrons at the molecule is it can break a bond. And when it breaks a bond, you get two smaller fragments. And the size of those fragments depends upon which molecule it is. So this is a classic example. You have two molecules, both of which have 58 as their molar mass. This one's propanone, and this one's propanal. Now both of those on an infrared would just show up with a carbon oxygen double bond, and so that won't help you distinguish between them. The 58 doesn't help you distinguish between them. You could do a chemical test, so you could react it with acidified potassium dichromate. This one would go orange to green because it can be oxidized, because it's an aldehyde. This one wouldn't go orange to green. But if you're using a mass spectrometer, they would look different as well. Now in the old specification, I used to get around this by just saying, compare it to a database. But it does mention fragmentation specifically. So, fragmentation is when you break a molecule into two parts. And you do that by breaking bonds. Now in propanone, you can break this bond, which would give you two sections. This one is methyl, that would weigh 15, and this one would weigh 43. And so you get a peak at 15, and you get a peak at 43. But you didn't have to break it there. You could also break this bond in which case you'd get a peak at 15 and a peak at 43. So that's just a bigger peak. And there's actually a lot of different bonds you can break. You can break more than one bond, but these are the two you'd expect to see, especially this 43. Because when this bond breaks, this carbon's already got a delta plus on it, and so it's more likely to have a full positive charge on it than the other carbon. And you can distinguish between this molecule and propanal, because when you break propanal, you can break it in more than one place. So if you break it here, you end up with a group that weighs 29 and a group that weighs 29. So they both weigh 29. And so with propanal, you'd end up with a big peak at 29. Whereas you wouldn't get that when splitting apart propanone. And so it gives you clues about the structure. What you need to be able to do is work out what ions caused each of these peaks. And they have to be ions. Because if that part is not charged, then it's not accelerated, it's not deflected, and it's not detected. You don't need to be able to explain how a mass spectrometer works, but you do need to know that everything that shows up on here is an ion, and it's a positive ion. This peak will be due to the whole molecule as a positive ion, so in both cases that's C3H6O+. This one will be due to this CH3CO+. This peak at 29 will be due to both this ethyl group and the aldehyde split off. And this peak at 15 will be due to a methyl group, a CH3+. And it's very possible to work these out, given the molecular formula and the masses of each atom. So for instance, 15, the only way you can get that is with a carbon and three hydrogens. For the 29 peak, then there's two different ways of making that. Two carbons with five hydrogens, or one carbon, one hydrogen, one oxygen. And so you can just do a little bit of trial and error to work out which atoms you can add together to make 29, or which atoms you can add together to make 43, and more often than not, there's only one way of doing it. 29 is the exception to that. And so that gives you a little bit of information about fragmentation. I cannot imagine a question where, on top of doing empirical formula, and mass spec, and infrared, and NMR, which is coming up next year, and chromatography, they also give you fragmentation patterns to look at, but I don't know, it might be a one mark question somewhere, and so there's the information if you want it. On the specification, it does say specifically that you should be able to suggest a structure for the fragment ions. So 
flow the 43, it might ask a simple question like, what possibly could be the structure of the 43 arm? In which case, I'll just use that trial and error method I talked about by adding atoms together until you made 43. And as long as that makes sense and you can draw it, then that's what you write as the answer. Okay, so that's the end of organic chemistry in AS. And the end of the AS units completely. Thank you very much for watching. I'll start with A2 next. And I hope you can join me for those. Goodbye.